is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 83. Today we're going to chat with Reed Hendricks from Valor Ridge. Gertrude wants you to know she's not as young as she used to be. And we're going to talk about optics. Today's panel is Sean Heron and I'm Ava Flannell. What does that mean? She's not as young as she used to be. Uh, I mean, I guess you'll have to find out. I can't wait. But Gertrude's me and like <laughs> well, I think I'm still young. Oh, okay. Well, if that's what you got to tell yourself, that's fine. That's, yeah. that's totally fine. Yeah, I'm not judging you at all. Okay, that's cool. Carry on. Manticore arms? I do like manticore arms. What do you want to talk about? Uh, in the show notes, it says the Scorpion Evo Trilug adapter. And I've actually been thinking about moving to some Trilug stuff just because of the suppressors that I use these days from Bowers Group, uh, they have a lot of Trilug adapters. So I've been thinking about that, but this is for the Scorpion Evo and basically it's for specific suppressor adapters. Makes it pretty easy and kind of a quick on and off type thing. So you can swap suppressors to different guns. And again, Manicore Arms making good stuff. Uh, ManicoreArms.com. Use the code GUNFUNNY15. That gets you 15% off. There you go. Learn the things you never knew on Deconstructing the Industry. Reed, thanks so much for joining us today. I want to know, okay, just like tell us a little bit about, about your backstory growing up, like how you got into firearms. Yeah, sure. No, I'm just going to say I'm grateful for having the opportunity to be on your show. Um, very, very happy to be able to share my views with your audience and with you as well. And um, I'm just great, grateful for that. So before we even begin, I just want to say thanks a lot, and I very much appreciate it. No, of course. You're uh, welcome. Glad to have you, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, my background, I mean, you know, I was younger. I, I mean, I played sports and, you know, football and wrestling and baseball and basketball, all that stuff. So I was always athletic. So what better way to do that than to get sent to summer camp, right? But my <laughs> folks sent me to summer camp when I was eight. I may not have even been eight. I may have been seven about to turn eight. And I was there for a couple of weeks. And uh, one of the blocks that they had was riflery. And so we shot single shot 22s. And to this day, the first bullet that I ever shot was a 22 long rifle Winchester Super X. I always remember the X on the back of the casing. So it was, uh, I was hooked from the first bullet of spent powder. I was hooked. And, uh, from there, it's just been on. I mean, you know, I shot as a teenager, hunted when I was in high school, ducks, pheasant, quail, geese, all that stuff. When I was 17, I joined the Marines and I uh, went in the infantry as an 0351 assaultman. I was also a designated marksman instructor. So, I mean, you know, it's just kind of evolved from there. So that's, I mean, how I got into it. But for the first time I shot, I was absolutely hooked on it. And I said, there's nothing, like, there's nothing I want to master more than this. That's pretty cool. You mentioned the MOS of Assaultman, and I, I, I actually didn't know what that was. So I looked it up, and it, it is actually pretty damn cool. Can you tell people, like, what that was? Sure. Um, that was an 0351, and... Uh, you know, so you go to regular infantry school, so, uh, school of infantry. So you're trained as a regular rifleman. I mean, the adage is that every Marine is a rifleman. But so I went to that initially. And then I went to a specialized school for assaultmen, which is, you know, you learn about armor, like tanks. You have to memorize, like, every tank on earth by, by sight and, like, side view, front view. And you got to know what it's carrying. I mean, there's a lot of it's. You know, supposedly one of the highest uh, GT scores in the infantry for an assault, and I'm not saying that I had one. I'm just saying I snuck in there. <laughs> um, but it was fun because, yeah, we got to shoot rockets. Like, when I was in, I was a dragon gunner. Now it's a javelin, which is a missile. But when I was in, it was a dragon. So it's like a <laughs> – it took like 10 seconds for this rocket to go a 1,000 yards. That's real handy when you're shooting at a tank, isn't it? <laughs> um <laughs> And so we got to learn how to do that and explosives and like C4 and TNT and make, you know, slider charges and shape charges and learn how to burn through concertina wire, you know, and saving Private Ryan when they're on the beach and they say Bangalore is up and then they, that huge explosion and they run through all the wire. That's, you know, a lot of the stuff that we did. So it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I thought it was actually really cool. They called, they called you guys like the PhD of infantry, uh, just because of all the knowledge you had to have. And it's like a kind of a jack of all trades type thing and master of most mm -hmm. in, instead of master of none right oh it was fun yeah it, we had to know a lot of stuff i mean we we did have to know we were very versatile so we were usually attached to a rifle you know a line company i was a weapons company so we always got chopped up into different rifle companies and so 
um, you know, it was actually a very versatile thing, and I had a lot of good buddies, too, so I had a very interesting experience in the Marines. It was like, I got to do a lot of cool, like, I mean, a lot of good training, and uh, I was very fortunate, and I still talk to a lot of my friends that are in today. Very so, nice. uh, friendship after 20 years of, you know, almost 20 years of knowing each other. That's badass. One of the things I saw is that they got rid of that MOS. Is that true? They're getting rid of a lot of, they're getting rid of a lot of things in the military that they probably should have kept. Yeah. They're going to find out the hard way. You know, they should have kept a lot of things the way they were and they're trying to change things. And, and I don't think that makes it more combat effective. And I don't think that people that are, you know, I don't know, I'm not trying to get too political, but I mean, I, I just think that there's a formula that worked. The Marine Corps is one of the oldest branches in the service. It yeah. predates the United States of America. Yep. And for all this time, you know, it's, it's worked. And, uh, so uh, yeah, they got rid of the O three fifty one, and I've got a T shirt. My you know my my girlfriend got me a T shirt O three fifty one assault, and I wear it very proudly. But uh, yeah, they're just they're just trying to save money. Yeah, it's not a good idea. Silly yeah, man, it's unfortunate. All right, so then from there, it says that you were in law enforcement. Yeah, I was a police officer, and um, I did that. I did undercover stuff, and I did. Dang, you had all the cool patrol. jobs. What's that? I said you had you, so far. You had all the cool jobs. Yeah, it was. I tried to cram as much adventure after high school as possible. So yeah, I did that as an undercover. I did task force. I was actually sent down to New Orleans for Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And um, people always ask me, "Who did you confiscate guns?" I was like, "What do you think? Like, do you think that I'm like this big Second Amendment proponent and uh, like one of the most passionate people about the Bill of Rights that there is? Of course not." All that stuff, I don't even, like, I think that was National Guard. That certainly wasn't us. In fact, to this day, I still don't know if I'm still a sworn in Louisiana State Trooper because when we all got down there, they swore us in as Louisiana State Troopers, but we never got the sworn in. <laughs> and one of the first things they said to us was, you have to understand that we are down here to help these people in the state of Louisiana. And this is the United States. And these people are allowed under the Constitution to have firearms and you will not violate the Second Amendment. And I was like, hell yeah. Like, that's what it's all about. I wish every place was like that. Yeah, that is pretty damn awesome. Mm -hmm. So take us from there. Uh, you were an adjunct professor at a point, and then you started training full-time. Like, uh, kind of guide us along that path a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I taught high school. I also taught college. I was, um, I was a high school teacher for three years. It was public high school. I taught in Illinois for one year, and I taught in Tennessee for two years. And um, that was the best, one of the best experiences of my life. I loved the kids. In fact, I never... I never wrote a single kid up or sent any of them down to the principal's office in three years. I never had a single discipline <laughs> issue. Um, it was fantastic. You know, it was great. I taught in, you know, in poor high schools. I didn't teach in the ritzy, you know, but it's not that there's anything wrong with that. I just, I just didn't teach there. I wanted, you know, kids, you know, kind of, I grew up and really enjoyed ta working with them. So I did that. And, uh, you know, I started training full time. I started getting real serious about it. And um, then I taught, they became a full-time firearms instructor in 2013. And uh, so it's been a heck of a ride for, I mean, this is seven years. I can't believe it. Yeah, no, that's pretty awesome. When did you get the the passion for uh, being a firearms instructor in a tactic or firearms tactics, however you refer to yourself? Uh, you know, it's something I never really sought out to do. You know, a lot of guys want to be firearms instructors, but I never sought out to do it at all. I always enjoyed helping people. I always enjoyed teaching people how to shoot better. So you keep seeing the same common mistakes over and over again, and then you have people, you know, flatten that out, polish it up, and they come away with a big smile on their face. So when I'd be at the, like, the public range, I'd see the guys, just, you know, cacking around in the two by fours, you know, and just, you know, just going crazy on their, you know, just just shooting with their eyes closed. Yep. Not that you know, sometimes they, sometimes they're like, hey man, it's all good. And uh, so we just work. And once I started seeing the positive feedback of people actually punching paper through the middle and hitting steel and getting that smile on their face. I was like, oh, this is cool. So maybe if I ever get a chance to do this for a living, you know, maybe I'll take that opportunity. And, and I most certainly did. Very nice. And then is that when you started uh, Valor Ridge? Uh, I started Valor Ridge in 2015 when I saw there's a need, a big, big need, you know, to train people in old school techniques and fundamentals with professionalism. Big need for that. And uh, I learned from the best. I learned from the old school guys like, like Chuck Taylor and Paul Howe and Tom Givens and, and all the old school guys, you know, just the, the really old school guys that have been doing this a long time. And I, I picked, you know, a lot of, of good things. And I noticed they all did the same things. And it was all about the fundamentals. It was all about not flashy gun handling. It was about just meat and potatoes, reliable techniques that have worked for centuries. And then I was like, yes, this is exactly how it's got to be. And then, of course, the professionalism, 
you know, when you teach people, when you're in front of a group of people, you got to be as professional as possible. And, um, you know, there's moments that will try you, that's sure. <laughs> but, you know, you want to be as, as, as professional as possible. And that's why I wanted to start Valor Ridge because I wanted just regular folks to be able to come out, train, and learn in an environment that's not intimidating, but learning how to do very intimidating things. What is Valor Ridge? Yeah, it's the company, uh, my firearms training company. We teach pistol and rifle classes. This is our fifth year, and we've enjoyed sold-out classes for four years. And in our our first half of our year, if you go to our schedule, it's sold out pretty much. Wow. Um, this is our fifth year of sold-out classes, and it's been an amazing thing. It's nothing that I've done. I've been blessed. You know, I've been very blessed, and, you know, I try to be uh, humble about things, but it's no, certainly not anything that I've done. I mean, yeah, we put in hard work here, but... You know, we've been blessed. Uh, that's that's the only way that I can explain it. So there's people that start schools all over the place, you know, and some good, some are horrible. But, uh, you know, we there's, there's nothing special other than we're doing fundamentals, and, and we've been blessed. And that's the only excuse, the only <laughs> explanation I have. I heard that you have a pretty awesome location out there. Yeah, we're in uh, Tennessee. We're in the extreme north. Or we're in East Tennessee, but we're right where Virginia and Kentucky meet. In fact, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm in my front yard, and I'm looking into three different states. I'm looking into Virginia, the Cumberland Gap, and Kentucky right there, and that's where Daniel Boone uh, crossed over into the mountains. So we're we're pretty remote. Very cool. And your classes are open to the public. Oh yes, absolutely. We don't we don't do any law enforcement only or military only. Although we've most certainly trained a lot of military and a lot of law enforcement, but we we train we train all law abiding citizens and, and and green card holders for sure. Awesome. And what types of classes do you offer? Yeah, we offer pistol and rifle. Some are two two days and some are four days. It just depends on how much time you got. Um, but we teach, you know. We just teach drawing from pistol, you know, drawn and one-handed shooting and just about anything you can possibly do with a pistol, uh, we do it. And, you know, on our first day of, of pistol craft, which is one of our flagship courses, you know, on the end, first day, you know, we've got people hitting targets at 50 yards with no problem whatsoever. Nice. So it's, uh, it's very, and, and this is of all experience levels. I mean, I've had on the same firing line, I've had a person, you know, in, in, in her 60s who's never even fired a gun and then a person on the other side of the, Line who's been, you know, Afghanistan three times. So it's, it's a very unique blend of people. Yeah, definitely. On your website, I read something that was kind of interesting that I'm hoping you can explain. It said, a gun owner and armed citizen are not the same. After training at Valor Ridge, you will know the difference. See you on the ridge. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's actually, you know, I kind of got that idea when I was reading Jeff Cooper's stuff. He said, owning a gun does not make you armed any more than owning a piano makes you a musician. Huh. <laughs> that's uh, that's actually and, really true. And, and so, you know, when I look at, um, you know, when I look at a lot of people, I mean, most people I've run, not, you know, since I've been teaching, but before then, you know, I see guys come to the range and they bring like five or six guns to the range every time they go and they shoot them, but they all like, they shoot any of them well. And they just kept changing and changing and changing and changing and changing. And, and so I was like, man, like, like, man, I've I got, you know, I was guilty of that myself, you know, buying a bunch of different ones and, and just kind of rotating them through. But then I realized the best shooters that I've ever seen who were typically would just stick with one or two. You know, they would stick with maybe one or two different kinds, and they'd get real good with those. And so an armed citizen and a gun owner are not the same. An armed citizen knows how to use their firearm. They know how to do it. And then more importantly than knowing how to do it, they, they've got the, the courage you know, inside, you know, they've got the courage inside to use that firearm when they need to. And, and you know, you can have all the stuff in the world. I mean, you can have all the, the training in the world. You can have all the, the gear and the guns and all that. But if you don't have the willpower, the courage, mm-hmm. you know, to clash arms with the enemy, it's kind of useless. Look at Parkland. You know, I mean, in Parkland High School, they had that school resource officer there. I mean, he had 20-plus years in law enforcement. He had a high-quality pistol. Obviously, he was proficient enough to carry a gun, according to the state of Florida, but he just stood there. Yeah. He didn't do anything. Yep, 100%. And that's, and that's what I'm talking about. You know, a gun owner and, a, and an armed citizen aren't the same thing. Mm-hmm. You put down some stuff that you wanted to talk about, and I want to dig into that a bit. Uh, one of the first things is knowledge versus belief. Is that a bit like the Dunning-Kruger scale? I, 
yeah, you picked up on that, man. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Knowledge versus belief. It, it, you know, I, um, when we're talking about firearms in general, everybody really wants to do it well. I mean, I don't know anybody that has a firearm that says, man, I want to be the worst shooter in the group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, we, we want to be good. And, you know, people get into firearms for a variety of reasons, you know, whether they're, they're brought up with it or maybe they had an incident in their life that spurred them on to get better or to, to carry a firearm. And, you know, maybe guys just, or gals want to be really good. They want to be really good. Maybe they go into the competition arena and there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But uh, knowledge versus belief is, is like, okay, knowledge comes from repeated outcomes in a dangerous environment. Like, that's where knowledge, you can read books, and that's fine. You know, reading books is good. Uh, I read a lot of books myself. Heck, I had to read, you know, like 50, 60 of them for when I wrote my book, just to get, you know, a background on stuff. But, you know, reading a book is good, watching a video is good, getting a DVD collection up is good. But true knowledge it comes from, from, from being there and, and seeing these things put into practice. Uh, belief is, well, I, I think, uh, you know, I think this will work because... Right. There's a big difference between knowing. Yeah. I see this so often. Like someone will get certified as an NRA instructor. And I think that's like a, that's a great starting point for people. I, I, I have no problem with that. I'm certified in a bunch of different stuff, but I always kind of saw it as a, as a starting point. And then what you'll see is kind of as people go on that, like suddenly now that they've got this certification, that suddenly they know everything and that their word is, is the ultimate and that no one can really tell them anything. And I, I don't know if that's because of the way the NRA, NRA classes and certifications are structured, but I, I see that a lot. And I'm like, that Dunning-Kruger scale is, is alive and well. Do you see it a lot with people coming into your classes as well? Oh, no, 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 we don't. We, I don't see that. The people who come here are generally very hungry for knowledge. You know, they're hungry uh, for learning. They want to get better. You know, it, it, it's a very cool environment. And I'm not saying that there may not have been some, there may, I'm not saying there may not have been somebody like that. It's just usually we're not that kind of vibe. We're not that kind of environment. But, it, you know, I have been in other classes as a student. I have taken classes where that most certainly has been the case. But, you know, that, that, but that goes to, you know, the person um, that I've noticed that the guys that have, that have done the coolest things, right? And, and, and I'm most certainly not one of those guys, but I mean, the guys that have done the coolest things like, like Paul Howe or, or Chuck Taylor, like those are the most humble dudes that you'll ever meet. And you know what? They, they're always wanting to learn more. And it's amazing. Like their, their resumes, I mean, they're, they're experienced, all their stuff. I mean, you could fill many books with it, but they're always, hum they're always hungry for more and they surely don't act like they know it all. They're confident in their material. I mean, they're very confident in themselves and their material. But they're not, uh, they're not know it alls. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. And I, I, I agree fully. Uh, let's dive into the next one, which you, which you labeled as, uh, proficiency. Tell us your thoughts on, on that word and kind of what it means to, to all of us as armed citizens. Sure. That's a good one. Proficiency. That's a state of, or of being advanced in an art or practice. Um, I always tell people there's no such thing as advanced shooting. You know, there's always, there's only the basics on demand you know, at speed if it's required. And, you know, proficiency is, is like, okay, the question that we always need to ask ourselves is, is how good am I? And that's always a question that people that own guns, a lot of people that own guns want to ask themselves is, how good am I? And a lot of people want to think, okay, I'm really, really good. I'm really good at this. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope so. I hope that's the case. But we also have to be honest. And the only way we really know how good we are is to shoot, our, to, to shoot against measurable standards. Um, you know, how, you know, what, uh, you know, what are you drawing and shooting one round in? Is it, is it 3.5 seconds? That's probably, you know, not ideal. Um, but then again, those are just raw tests of skill. You know, now we go into a tactical environment. You know, we've got shoot, no shoot targets. We've got, uh, maybe this person has a weapon, maybe they don't. I don't know this person's intentions. Uh, there's, you know, kids running behind them. We're in a school. We're in a movie theater. And there's so many variables. So all that speed shooting in the world, that's not going to help you in an environment like that. We need to shoot deliberately. Uh, I did a video about the LAPD shooting a woman who was a hostage. This guy had a knife to her throat. And these police were no more than five yards away. I mean, there was four or five of them surrounding this, this person. And they were no more than five yards away. Well, as soon as one officer shoots, all of them open up. And, you know, yeah, they killed the bad guy. But you know who else they killed? 
a hostage, shot her right right in the, yeah. in the throat or the face, I think, because mm-hmm. they wanted to shoot faster than their own ability. Mm-hmm. And, you know, speed shooting's cool. I love going out to the range and getting the timer going and, like, burning it down, and that's fun. But if I've chosen to focus on, on combat shooting and, you know, being able to discriminate targets and using photographic stuff like that, and um, I've really transitioned that because when we first – when you first do this, man, there's going to be a hell of a temptation to want to just always beat the timer, always beat the timer, always beat the timer. But all it is is fundamentals. Yeah, I mm-hmm. agree. What about uh, martial attitude? Yeah, martial attitude. And that's, that goes back to earlier about being willing, you know, being, first of all, making the decision to have a firearm. I mean, there's 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 all kinds of people that just won't do it. I mean, they'll say, oh, I don't I don't need a gun. If I'm, I don't go out looking for trouble. You don't have to go out looking for trouble. Sometimes trouble's looking for you. You know. Yes. Yeah. I'm not like we're not sick, twisted people because we have firearms. It's like we I carry firearms because there are sick, twisted people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that person in New Zealand. But you know, you think about having a gun and not just having it, but having it loaded, having it on your body when you live your daily life, and then having the courage, as I mentioned earlier, to use that when it matters and being able to make the shot. Courage is great, and I always say that your decision, your, your willingness to shoot will always trump your ability to shoot. Like, your willingness to get in the fight will always trump your ability to actually shoot. But you do have to be able to hit what you're shooting. You know, that's one of the big, big things. So it's kind of all three, and we talk about this in class, that you got to be armed, willing, and able, you know, to, to do what needs to be done. And that's that's martial attitude. Yeah, one of the things that I always like to think about is, you know, we don't need to convince people that guns are are the best way to defend your life. We don't need to convince people that everyone should own guns. Like, honestly, if we could just convince people that their life is more important than someone who should wish to rob them of it, they'll come to Mm -hmm. the gun conclusion on their own. Once that once they decide that their life is more important than someone uh, who wants to steal it, then instantly they're going to figure out the best way to to do it. And clearly guns are one of the best ways. (laughs) Well. I always ask people that, that make the argument of, oh, I, I do this martial art. And I'm, I love martial arts. I love jujitsu and wrestling. I love all that. You know, I, I love getting on the mat and rolling with dudes. I, I love it. But the thing is, is like, uh, I'm not as talented of a martial artist as Bruce Lee was. And Bruce Lee carried a 38. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> that makes that right there. That should be on t-shirts everywhere in the universe because. Right. If we could get Are you people tougher to... than it would be like a flow chart. Are you tougher than Bruce Lee? Uh, if the answer is yes, uh, you know, put you know, impossible. If it's no, then yes, carry gun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally agree. Uh, we're going to take a quick moment. We're talking to Reed Hendricks from Valor Ridge, and we are going to hear from our buddies over at Hack Equipment. Hey guys, if you own a gun store or you do uh, gun shows, you might want to consider selling Hackett Equipment products. Definitely a great opportunity. Contact Greg over at HackettEquipment.com. Maybe you just want to buy one of their bags. Just uh, go to HackettEquipment.com and use the code GUNFUNNY20 and that gets you 20% off. There you go. All right, we're back with Reed. So yeah, we just talked about Bruce Lee and I totally agree. I think that would be like an amazing t-shirt, but also just amazing mindset for people to have history. You mentioned history and I know that you're, you're kind of big into that topic and I think that'll actually lead into my next question, but what are your thoughts on kind of uh, history as you, as you put it in the show notes? Yeah. I thought on history are that even amongst the first four people on earth, there's a 25% homicide rate. So that means that we're pretty good at killing each other. Um, that mean, doesn't mean that everybody likes to, and that doesn't mean that that's the goal of everybody, but what we do know is that people do hurt each other. And it's funny how the, the, pe- the people that get hurt the most are the ones that are disarmed. That's kind of irrefutable. You know, I mean, if you, if you look at history, I mean, governments have disarmed their citizens and, and killed them by the, by the hundreds of millions. And, you know, people, they were doing this even before firearms. They enacted arms control on their own citizens, you know. And in Rome, they, they had only only Roman, you know, only certain people in there could carry weapons in public, and on and on through the Middle Ages. And so, yeah, I, there's always this tendency of, of of people to want to take arms out of the hands of good people. There's, that's a huge tendency, and one that I hope that you know we're seeing the end of. But I don't know if that'll ever stop. Mm-hmm. I know. If anything, it just seems like it's getting worse. You you seem yeah. to be fairly political. 
when did this start exactly? Or have you always been very political? No, it's just not that I, not like out openly. Uh, I haven't always been that way. That's been very recent. But when I was younger, I, I always, and my parents never talked about politics. I mean, I couldn't tell you which way they voted. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you because they never talked about who they were voting for. But I know that the first time that I really felt negatively towards the power of, of government, because I'm not like anti-government. I'm not like a person that, that's against the government. I, I'm for constitutional government. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's what I'm for. So one of my earliest memories of, of bad things happening in this country was Waco. I remember being in Bellamard Middle School, actually, and we went to the library and watched that unfold. And I just kept asking myself, why, how could this happen in this country? This is never supposed to happen. And, you know, of course, Ruby Ridge was, was right on, right in the same proximity time frame as that. And, and it just kept going on and on and on. And when I got older, like when I got out of the Marines, I wasn't political. Law. I just, I was on permanent liberty, man. I was going to have fun and go to school. And, you know, I didn't really, every day was gravy. You know, every day was cool. But then, you know, I started seeing some things and heard some things on college campuses that I said, how, could any logical person come up with that argument? And really what what did it for me was being in, in graduate school and hearing some of the points of view about our founding fathers, just very derogatory. And, and, I, and, I, and I didn't understand where they were coming from until I, you know, I realized that this has been happening for decades in this country is this kind of subversive deal going on. So that's why I got political. And and I've just got a platform to do it. It's Mm -hmm. not that I didn't stand up to them in school because I would, you know, I'd debate them openly in class. I mean, I had dozens of people come up to me after class and say, I'm glad you said something because it was getting pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, you know, would do that. I had the respect of the professors because they knew, you know, they knew that I I wasn't just going to come in there and argue with emotion. I was going to bring facts and, and evidence and things like that. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I got political because, you know, I see, and people from other countries that like from, you know, from Cuba and East Germany and the former Soviet Union, you know, these people, you listen to them talk and they're like, man, I, I got away from these countries to come to America because I thought it could never happen here. But now it's sounding like it did. You know, and we're hearing a lot of the same arguments that we heard back in our home country. And it's kind of scary. I was like, wow. So I got a voice to say it, you know, talk against it, and I'm going to use every opportunity I can. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. It is nice that you have a large audience and you can kind of, because I, I don't think, you know, I try to incorporate as much uh, political beliefs as possible lately, and I've never been the type that, you know, really even discuss politics. But I think that we're definitely in a uh, kind of a bad spot. And, you know, the more that we could educate pe- people, the better. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Eva. I mean, we are in a bad spot because, I mean, there's only so much. I mean, I mean, when you vote one way and, you know, uh, really nothing gets done. And then, of course, the alternative is if you vote the other side, <laughs> you know, you vote the other side, stuff is surely going to get done. It's just going to shred the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's kind of we're at it. We're, we find ourselves in between you know, a rock and a hard place, so to speak. But, you know, there's more people. I mean, I just know more and more people every year are kind of realizing what's going on. And I don't think it's too late. I just think that the more people need to put down the March Madness and the sports every now and then. And, you know, maybe they divert some of that energy towards more productive Mm -hmm. spending of time. I completely agree. Where do you see, like, what do you see happening uh, with our rights in the near future? I think good states are going to keep being good. I mean, look at um, South Dakota and Oklahoma and Kentucky, all just recently passing constitutional carry. How the hell is that? It's freaking um, awesome. Yeah. That is, yeah, that's imagine the Second Amendment saying, meaning exactly what it says. Uh, shall not be infringed. You know, keep, keep's a pretty easy word to understand if you look up the Merriam Webster. I mean, keep means to have or possess. Yes. Right? Bear, bear means to carry upon one's body. So, I, you know, I don't. You know, it's not that unclear of a definition. So, yeah, the, the constitutional carry is pretty solid. There's, you know, a third of the states right now constitutional carry, and more if you include open carry without a permit. And so I think compared to a long time ago, the Second Amendment is 
in, in some places much better protected than it was, but in other places it's much worse. I mean, I, I, California and New York and Massachusetts and Hawaii and Illinois, I mean, I could go, there's so many states like that, and I feel bad for those people because, I mean, look at Colorado. I mean, look at the bull crap they pulled a couple years ago on, on you guys. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah. 2013, I mean, July 1st. Yep, I mean, and they're still trying to pull stuff. Oh, constantly. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, nobody, the sheriffs aren't following it. They're not enforcing the law, which is great. That's exactly what they're supposed to do is not enforce unconstitutional laws. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're going to see that. And I see it. What do you see? What do I see up with the right? I see a checkerboard. I see the nation becoming a checkerboard. I think you're going to hop from oasis to oasis. And in between is the horrible areas. I mean, look at Chicago or New York City or, or L.A. I mean, look at those places. I mean, how, how can anybody say that that's even America? And I'm not even talking about the people that live there. I'm talking about the, the the taxes they pay and the gun control laws. And I couldn't imagine that. Like I'm like I like our experiences across this country are vast and different. But I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine being in a place like New York City and, and paying when it's all said and done after federal, state, county, city taxes, paying sixty percent of my income to a tyrannical government that hates me. Mm-hmm. You know, I couldn't imagine that. Yep. Amen. Totally, one hundred percent agree. Hmm. I want to move back to uh, to firearms real quick. I, I saw yeah. on your website, Pistol Craft. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. You alluded to it when you talked about all the research you had done, reading a, bu- a ton of books uh, in, in order to write your book. But I just saw it. I actually just bought it, and I, I can't wait to see it. But tell, okay, kiss ass. T- tell us about it. Well, thank you. I appreciate. You. I really appreciate that, man. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Sean's always okay. trying to it kiss winter, us. It was winter time, you know. It was, it was in the bowels of winter, and I guess winter for us, you know, for us and you, maybe a different definition. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you know, it, it gets a little cooler up here, but we had a real cold winter uh, last winter, and so I was inside a lot. It was by my wood burning stove, and um, as I was there, I just got off the computer because I had been reading a lot because you I mean heck, you can't do anything outside, right. you know, it's, it's just too cold. And um, I'd already cut and split all my wood, but I was inside with the wood burning stove, and I just got the computer out, and I just started writing. And at first, it was just some thoughts. You know, it was just um, a couple things here, a couple things there. And eventually, that started forming into a pretty long paper. And I took the time to footnote it properly so that people could see where I'm getting the information. And, you know, as it, as it went on, I was like, wow, this going to be a book, because I've already got 100 pages. Yeah. And you know, from there it turned into a it turned into a work, and so it just went out public last month. So it, it's been an amazing deal. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw February fifth, two thousand nineteen, is kind of when it was. And you mentioned earlier a pistol craft co- a pistol craft course as well. I imagine those two tie together pretty heavily. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover. I mean, there's, there's a lot of crossover because. To me, I mean, I don't want to create fancy names for classes, you know? <laughs> right. You know, it's not like dynamic explosive response handgun one, you know, or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it's just pistol craft. That's what it's always been known as. I mean, it's been known as that since 1540, you know? So it's, um, it's a very just simple, you know, there's, it's, it, it call it what it is because words have power. Words have meaning. And, you know, pistol craft is a craft of learning how to use the pistol and applying the pistol. Yeah, I agree. I'm really excited, man. I, I I actually hadn't seen that it came out, so I'm I'm glad to uh, see that it's out and can't wait to get it in. I I even actually ordered the paperback, which I almost never do, just so I can take notes and and you know dog ear corners and stuff like that. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that very much. It's it's done amazingly well. Like it's it's defied all my expectations, and it it's just it, like I said, all this has been incredible. I almost can't believe that the last five years has been real. That's, yeah. that's pretty damn cool. I noticed on your, on your calendar that there's also medical courses, obviously, uh, with the Patriot nurse, but tell us why medical is important and what those kind of, what those classes cover. Oh, great question, man. You know, there's so many people that, that carry guns and they don't even worry about the medical. They'll say, Oh, don't worry. I don't plan on losing a gunfight. And so I don't know if anybody ever really does. Um, but you do know it's possible that you could still win and still get shot, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, but- even if it's not you, it's somebody else. Yeah, without question. I'm like, that, that's great. The gunfight lasts, you know, four or five seconds, and then there's <laughs> hours of craziness. Oh, I'll tell you, it, it's amazing. And, you know, this, and, and just to illustrate the point here is, like, why medical? Like, number one, you know, half of the people in Club Pulse that were shot, mm-hmm. well, a lot of them were shot by the police, but um, other than that, 
you know, the ones that were shot of the 50 that died, you know, almost half of those could have been preventable with blood loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, lot, lots of brachial disruptions and things like that stuff that's easily uh, maintainable and controllable with just a little bit of mindset and uh, applied skill. Yeah. And there's and there's exactly right. And then there's pulse and there's the Parkland. A lot of those kids that died at Parkland died from blood loss and that's completely preventable because paramedics, you know, EMS is not going to be on scene for a long time. I mean, it, 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 and I'm talking unicorn, rainbow, flowers, and sunshine case scenario. They'll be there in a half hour, and that never happens. You're mm-hmm. talking more like one, maybe even two hours. And when you consider that blood loss happens, you know, within a couple of minutes, you know, depending on where you're hit, it's not very much time. So uh, medical stuff, we, we actually have several different types of medical classes. We've got our traumatic injuries class, which is a one-day class, um, and that teaches how to fix you know, puncture wounds and gunshot wounds and common things that happen, you know, just to, to buy people time to get to the hospital, to, you know, to keep them alive. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, our other medical stuff is, is medical prep with Patriot Nurse. She does that because she's been doing this a long time, and she's very talented at what she does. What she does. And she um, she put together those courses and been teaching those for a long time. Um, I think seven or eight years she's been teaching those. She's been on the road. Um, she doesn't really want to be on the road anymore. She wants to be here and hanging out. And uh, cause we got a garden we just plowed up, so <laughs> we got a lot nice. to do. But, you know, she medical preps. See, people prep with, with ammo and guns and, and food, and that's great. You should be. A lot of people don't prep with their medical stuff. And, yeah, that's uh, actually that's a really crucial. good point. Oh, yeah. W- in Sudan, you know, just to illustrate, like in Sudan, you know, even that it's a war-torn country. You know, I mean, that's that's massive genocide happening. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the deaths come from disease, not from actual conflict or from uh, interpersonal combat. Yeah, I was looking at the New Zealand. I was watching that video, and I watched it multiple times just so I could, you know, try to take whatever lessons I could away from it. And when the the murderer walks into that room, the big room, the first room, there's just two clumps of people in opposite corners of the room, just like just a big mass of humanity, just laying on top of each other, just ready for the, just ready for whatever. And you know, it's, it's awful to watch that. And then I always think about it. Well, this guy, he was there for just like 15 seconds or something like that. I thought it was 15 minutes. Uh, in that first building. I don't know. I watched the video. It was, it was pretty short. Actually. He goes back in that room a couple of times. One guy tries to escape and runs into him and knocks him down uh, he ends up killing that guy, but he goes back in and just unloads multiple times. So if you do survive that, just the thought of, of sitting there and, you know, A, not being prepared, B, not having any skills or, or mindset to, to be prepared for what happens after that, it, it freaks me out. And mm-hmm. th- that's why medical is so important to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, you put it in the context of, of, you know, a group of people like that, but let, I mean, not, not being morbid, but I mean, what if that was somebody that you really loved and cared about, like your mom or dad or your wife or your fiance or husband or or kid or grand I mean think about it. you're you're watching them die yeah. and you can't do anything about it. And to me, like yeah, we well the point of carrying a gun is to save people's lives. But that's only one part of the equation. Yeah, we've got firearms that save lives, but that medical equipment saves lives. I mean I carry a tourniquet and a pressure dressing uh, on my body every day, you know, in case uh, you know it happens. And I've had a lot of students you know, they've had to use their, their firearm after they've left here, but I've also had students have to use the medical training um, that they have. In fact, there was a guy heading back home uh, from a class, and it was a motor. he saw a motorcycle wreck on the interstate. I mean, the guy dumped his bike maybe at 70 miles an hour and, um, you know, of course, goes flying off of it. But, you know, the, you know those um, the mile markers on the side of the road? Yeah. When he flew off the bike, his leg hit one of those. Uh. Mm-hmm. And so you know what happens there. I mean, you're talking yep. some busted T-bird pops out. You know, you got some major arterial bleeding. Well, the guy had been practicing for leg arterial bleeding for the last couple of days. So it was automatic. He stops, gets out of the car, sees the guy there, applies the tourniquet. Paramedics get there, and they tell him, you saved this guy's life. There's no way we would have been here in time, and there's no way direct pressure would have stopped that bleeding. And they go, how did you do this? He says, well, I've been doing it for the last couple of days. And see, that's just, I mean, that person's alive now, mm-hmm. you know, and wouldn't have been. It's yeah. just amazing the amount of positive ripples that happen when good people get together and learn important stuff. Mm-hmm. Totally 100%. He's like, I learned it yesterday. <laughs> yep, perfect timing. <laughs> this is easier than the drill. <laughs> yeah. Yep. One of our listeners wants to know, do you still run two Glocks? And 
two Glock 19s, uh, left and right appendix. No, no, I, I don't do that. I, I run a regular 19 from appendix. That's my primary. Um, and so then I, for my backup gun, I use my uh, J-frame Smith on my ankle. Nice. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, guys, I, I'm getting older. I'm not 20 anymore. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, it's hard to do those full, two full size pistols. And and really, I just, you know, I, I look at it. I'm like, you know what? I, I, as long as I got two on me, I'm good. Mm-hmm. There you go. I like it. What are your future plans? I'm gonna leave that up in the air. I may write one more book, another book, maybe several more. I don't know. I mean, that I'm very content actually. Uh, very content with with how things are. It's kind of scary because that's an unusual feeling because the last 20 years has been such a rocket ride, you know. I mean, it's been just absolute takeoff and nonstop and always doing something and always having some kind of goal and always having, you know, but I realized something last year. I realized that if your life is spent in constant pursuit of other things, it's like Ferris Bueller says, you know, Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop every now and then to take a look around once in a while, you may miss it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm pretty content right now. I've, I've, we had our first class last week. Great, amazing experience. Have another one coming up this weekend, I mean, or not this week, this Sunday, this Sunday. And so I just, I'm very content with the way things are. I may add another class. I don't know. We've got six. I mean, I I may add a lucky seven, right? But <laughs> we we may add another class. I, I don't know. I mean, if you can write one class, you can write a thousand. Mm-hmm. True that. And you're also going to work on the garden. We're going to work on the garden. In fact, <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. It's 6,000 square feet. Dang. Whoa. Okay, that's uh, like... That's not a garden. That's yeah, like a... a farm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I am on a farm. <laughs> so awesome, man. Yeah. Where can people yeah. uh, keep up with all the stuff that you're doing? Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Reed Henricks. It means R-E-I-D. And then last name Henrichs, H-E-N-R-I-C-H-S. That's my YouTube channel. And, you know, our Valor Ridge website, ValorRidge.com. I love it, man. And uh, I can't wait to get Pistol Craft. You guys can find that on Amazon. There's links to it from all his websites. But if you just go to Amazon and search for Pistol Craft, uh, it pops up both the Kindle and the paperback version. Those are there as well. Now, Reed, you're going to stick around with us for a bit, right? Because we got to talk some more gear. We got to talk, oh, yeah, we got to talk yeah. optics. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm at your disposal. All right. Sounds good. Uh, let's see. Where are we at, Ava? Uh, we're going to talk about Q. So, uh, they're coming out with a chassis. Uh, right now, the name is called the Side Chick. Hopefully, it sticks. Seem, uh, people seem to like that name. Uh, basically, it's modeled after the fixed, and it's for uh, any standard Remington 700s. It only weighs 2.5 pounds, which is pretty incredible. And just like the fix, it has that folding, fully adjustable stock, and uh, MSRP is going to be about 1500 So uh, definitely, you know, keep on staying the lookout for that. If you want to check out any of their other products, go to livekeywordie.com. All right. Sounds very, very cool. And they also sponsor... Our Knowledge Bomb segment, right? That's correct. Dropping wisdom. Slinging truth. Prepare yourself for Knowledge Bomb. All right. So first we have Frank Zappa and his friends were confronted at home by a fan brandishing a gun. Frank took him to the pond outside and invented a ceremony where everyone had to throw something in it. The fan threw his gun. Yeah, so this is from the book, uh, the real Frank Zappa book, and uh, it's available out there. But yeah, so this dude shows up at their place. He's like waving a gun around. They're like, oh, hey, uh, you know, if, if the cops show they're up like, here, they're going to see that and you're going to be in big trouble. And then he said, Hey, I know, I know there's a place where you can hide it. So they, they do this mystical ceremony. They actually call it help the raven hide his gun. They all throw little trinkets in the, in the water and then the dude throws it, throws the gun in the water. And then they're like, okay, awesome. That's great. Now you should leave right now. And then they moved. Hmm. Yeah. So true story, at least according to uh, that book. Interesting. Yeah. I thought so too. Yeah. Super interesting. It sounds like they were just all doing drugs or something. <laughs> well, yeah, they were. Next is, on the first day of the assault of Iwo Jima, Tony Stein cleared multiple enemy pillboxes using his custom M1919 machine gun named Stinger. 
During the assault, he made a total of eight trips back to the beach to reload on ammunition and carried a wounded soldier on his back each trip. Yeah, this is actually also true. And this one kind of intrigued me. So I, I read a ton about it. But uh, so Stinger was basically a naval airplane gunner gun. It was the A&M-2. And it was similar to the 1919, but a little bit smaller and lighter. It still weighed over like 23 pounds, something like that. So it was pretty heavy, something crazy. But anyway, uh, he gets on the beach. He's He's using his stinger to, to kind of hold them down in these pillboxes and takes out 20 enemies himself. Also, because the stinger consumes ammunition so fast, he's constantly going back to resupply his ammunition. Every time he goes back, he carries a wounded Marine on his shoulder and, and goes all the way down. So he actually survived that battle. Uh, he died about 11 days later on March 1st and uh, was posthumously awarded the the medal of honor and uh, just it was kind of crazy like this finger was a you know it was a an aircraft gun that he had modified he was like a tinkerer and uh he had kind of made it his own thing did it say what he died from uh he died in combat oh. uh, march 1st he was killed by a sniper while leading a 19-man patrol to reconnoiter a machine gun emplacement which had company a pinned down wow yeah uh, reed have you ever seen any of those stingers or the pictures of them or anything yeah, I've seen pictures of them. They're <laughs> the ones that they used back then. They, man, those guys really had to know what they were doing because there's a lot of moving parts on them compared to the ones we had. Right? Yeah, I was just, yeah. I was kind of, I was shocked at, that he was carrying that around and just laying waste to the enemy. <laughs> he was, he said Iwo Jima. That the old saying was that Marines didn't fight on Iwo Jima; they fought in it. The Japanese didn't fight on Iwo Jima; they fought in it. Um, they <laughs> yeah. had all those networks in there and those tunnels and. Out of 20-something thousand Japanese that defended the island, like less than 200 of them surrendered. Man. <laughs> that rooster's coming over to say hi. <laughs> I was just wondering what that noise was. Oh, uh, that's awesome. So, yeah, Tony Stein, uh, truly, truly a hero. Yeah, and definitely. Good story. I was really glad to, to read that knowledge bomb. Much better than those hippies the first time. That, you know, <laughs> the first Zappa. knowledge bomb, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, have you ever heard of Matador Arms? I have. What have you heard? Uh, they make a ton of SKS accessories. Were they talking about me? I don't think anybody really talks about you. They were talking shit? Mm, probably. Okay, that's fair. But yeah, SKS. I mean, stuff. but that's just like the, you know. So I was actually just looking the other day for an SKS, but they're still, they're still a little bit over what I want to pay for them, but they're coming down a bit, I think. Yeah, it is kind of crazy how expensive they've gotten. But lots of people have them. So that's the thing is lots of people have them and they are out there. You can totally get them. And if you want to make yours better, they've got their chassis for it. They've got all kinds of muzzle devices for it. They've got optics rails for it. So especially people like stuck in Canada, SKSs are something you can own. Uh, people in New Jersey, I know that Tony Simon from Simon Says Train and the Second is for Everyone diversity shoot, he actually has an SKS with tons of stuff, including the Sabertooth chassis on his SKS and uh, loves it. So matadorarms.com coupon code is gunfunny10. That gets you 10% off. All right. Now this is the part where we embarrass ourselves because Matador Arms also sponsors our prank call segment. It's time for prank calls with Malcolm and Gertrude. Honey. Uh, hi there. I'm looking for a gun. Say that again. Uh, I'm looking for a handgun for self-protection. Okay. So, uh, what you got? What do we got? We got, what do you, well, all right. Uh, <laughs> are, are you familiar with handguns? Uh, I mean, he is, uh, like, a little bit. So, normally I would be looking for a semi, but, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just not as young as I used to be. Uh, so I'm probably gonna have to use a revolver. Uh, before that, you know, I had no problem like throwing hands, you know, but again, my hands are not what they used to be. <laughs> okay. Well, revolvers, a revolver is a good choice for self-defense. I mean, that's something you can put rounds in it and throw it in the sock drawer and a year later pick it up and it'll still shoot. So. Okay. Yeah. Cause yeah. you know, I, I mean, normally I would say like, I've really never owned guns cause before that I could maybe even just run away. But again, my, my, even my legs, they're not what they used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I could throw down that East Coast mentality, uh, you know, but even then, now that I moved, it's just really not what it used to be. Oh, I understand. Uh, <laughs> are you looking for a particular, keep it under this kind of money or? Uh, yeah, you know, really, yeah, cause I don't really make the money that I used to make. Uh, okay, well, re 
revolvers run anywhere from uh, uh let's see I can get one for two forty nine all the way up to six hundred dollars. So Oh, okay. Yeah, two forty nine sounds nice. What what is that? That is a uh Rock Island thirty eight Semno. It's got a hammer on it so you can cock it and shoot it. Uh you know, okay. what they call single action. That's a, a good good choice because well, it takes a lot less pressure trigger pull to once you cock it, you know, when you're in single action than than to pull it with double action. So that's kind of a good way to go. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, because even my fingers, they're not what they used to be. So I appreciate it. I'm going to stop on by and uh, and uh, Rock Island. I'll, I'll remember that. Thank you so yes, much. You okay, bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually have one of those Rock Island 38s. Poor Gertie. She's getting old. <laughs> yeah, not what she used to be. But then I was like, man, this is really awkward because, Reed, didn't you say that you carry a revolver? And, and I was like, yeah, you a know. J-frame. Yeah, I was like, no, I thought he saw a... You didn't say J-frame, did you? Yeah, that's my backup. That's my J-frame, and that's oh, okay. the only reason it's because it's so light. I I wouldn't ever use it as my primary. Okay, well, I was like, this is awkward. Our guest <laughs> carries a revolver after yeah, I just it, said it, it, no. It, 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 <laughs> no, I, I, I carry a 19, and my, the revolver is my backup. You know, that reminded me of uh, Coffee Talk with Linda Richmond, that Saturday Night Live skit. Do you remember that one with Mike Myers? <laughs> yes, I do, actually. Welcome to Coffee Talk. I'm Linda Richmond. <laughs> Rhode Island is the Rhode Island Island. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you could totally do prank calls with us. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Actually, can I just say, like, so where I got the idea is I flew into Boston a few weeks ago and I was waiting. I was at the airport and I was waiting for my luggage and there was like these old people and uh, one guy almost knocked one of the older gentlemen d- over. And he turned to his wife and he was like, if, if I was 20 years younger, I tell ya. Like he was about to, you know, throw down, to throw hands. <laughs> and I just kind of laughed. And then I was like, gosh, I miss the East Coast so much to a degree. <laughs> so that's where I got that idea. Throwing hands at East Coast mentality. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Polymer 80. So did you know that you guys could get, uh, serialized frames at Rainier Arms and Brownells? I did actually. And what that means is they're already finished for you. You can just buy the frame and you don't have to finish it. Well, and also I think that some people are a little skeptical about not having a serialized frame, especially if they use that gun for self-defense, which personally I don't care. But I know that there is that, that, you know, kind of that fear exists. So, um, if you enjoy Palm Rady and you want to get one, but you're, you know, you just don't feel comfortable making one yourself. Just check out Rainier Arms or Brownells. But if you do want to get one that's non-serialized, you could go to polymer80.com, use the code GUNFUNNY, and that will get you 10% off. There you go. It's time to talk about some gear. Tactic Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. So, Reed, you said before we started the show that you wanted to talk about optics. Sure, I, we can talk about optics. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. So, when uh, I think a lot of people are just like always confused about like how to choose kind of the right optic for them, and maybe you could give some advice on optic choices. And, yeah, um, because I know, like, so I just got two guns. I got the fix, and then I also got a, a three hundred eight from Palmetto, and. So I need I need optics for long distance shooting, and I gotta say, like, I guess I never really. I never really looked into optics. Like my knowledge on it is, uh, is pretty minimal. So that's why when you were like, Oh, we can talk about whatever holster optics. And I was like, yes, optics. Cause I would love <laughs> to know what you recommend. Oh, so are you talking about for your, for your 308? Yeah. Th- I have a 308 and then a 6.5. Read more. Yeah. Oh, okay. Man, you know, I, I mean, it depends on what you want to spend. I, I'm always a big believer in quality. You know, I, I always buy something like one time I cry about. I don't even cry about. I celebrate anymore. But I mean, I, you know, I, I've cried over things, but then felt instantly better when it came in the mail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it just depends on what your budget is. I mean, for for people that that want to shoot a 308, I mean, you're really, I mean, realistic. I mean, I've shot 308 at, at you know 1400 yards, 1200 yards, 1300. I got shot at that far, but that's not really what it's, it's wheelhouse is. You know, it's wheelhouse is generally from about 400 to 800 yards. So mm-hmm. I, I think a, a nice, like, two and a half ten would be perfect for that. You know, a nice two and a half by 10 power, 
I'm a big fan of Night Force. You know, they're expensive, but I'll tell you what, they're tough and they're going to last for a long, they'll last your whole life if you take care of them. I think there's generally, yeah, and I think there's generally a misconception. People are like, oh, let's get like the absolute highest magnification we can get. (laughs) Whereas, uh, there's a lot of people in the know that think, you know, like 10 X, I mean, even for scout snipers and stuff like that, or I'm not sure if they teach that to DMR, but a lot of them work at 10 X, you know, as long as you can see the target in your reticle, they go as low as possible. Sure. And yeah, I use the fix 10 as a DM. I use a loophole fix 10, but I mean, I like the variable, let's say it's a lot more versatile. You know, you can, you can build up close, you know, if you need to go less, a two and a half 10 would be perfect for that gun. And, And here's the other thing, the higher quality glass that you get, the less magnification that you'll need. So let's say that it's only a 10 power, but it's a real good night force and it's 10 power. That's going to be like most other places, 15 or or even 20, you know? So the high quality glass is where you want to, is what you want to go with. And I'd I'd recommend a two and a half, 10 in that role for the 308, because that's going to, that's a perfect scope for that rifle. If I was, if I had a 308, like a semi-auto 308, that's, or even a bolt gun in 308, that's what I'd be rocking. Nice. What What about about for the 6.5? Oh, you can go higher. Uh, Night Force makes it with a three and a half, fifteen. You know that'd be perfect for that as well. Yeah, that. So Night Force are are very nice, but they are definitely spendy, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. And if you want to go like maybe, I mean, not, not everybody can afford that kind of thing, and I understand. Yeah, believe it or not, guys, SWFA makes an awesome variable power scope. Um, SWFA for, and I mean, they're not, they're not nearly as clear. I mean, they're not nearly as clear, but they are robust and they, they do hold zero very well and they're, they're waterproof and all that. So people that may not be able to afford the night force or a loophole or something like that, uh, the SWFA would be a nice choice to look into. You said FWSA? SWFA. Yeah. Okay. Zero SW. Whiskey Foxtrot Alpha. Huh. I actually don't think I've ever heard of that brand i think i've heard yeah. of it but i don't think i've ever used any yeah they're good they really are i had a three by nine um had a, i recommend that to a buddy also he had an fal and he wanted to run a variable power and he got the three by nine and he was killing it out here at mid-range rifle with it hmm. damn that's pretty awesome and the, yeah they're definitely reasonable um i'm looking yeah. at one the three to 15 is a uh, 6.99 on amazon dang yep. it'd, be, it'd good. be a good choice for that rifle and the thing is, a good scope's good, but you, you know, a quality scope is good, but you want to get some good rings for it, or a good mount, and that's the key. You know, good rings, I mean, that, that makes the difference of, of everything. I mean, you, you got to have it rock steady. It's got to hold zero, and so make sure you get a good quality set of rings with it as well. And what would you recommend for that? Believe it or not, I really am a big fan of Burris rings. Those, those are great. You know, LaRue makes a really good mount if you're using it on like an ar is it an ar type rifle uh for the for the 6.5 creedmoor no it's a bolt gun but it does have it does have a rail on top and then the 308 is definitely a ar ar 10 mm-hmm. yeah look into look into those larue mounts those are pretty money i mean they're they're good uh they're about 200 maybe 250 bucks for the mount but i'll tell you what like it's gonna hold zero and it's gonna stay on the gun and it's not that thing is not gonna move I have my SPR, uh, I've got an SPR in 5.56, but I run low power on that because the quality of the glass is so good, I don't need anything more. I run a 1 to 4, and I'm making headshots at, at 5 yards with it in 5.56. So, I mean, it's uh, with a LaRue mount. And you know what? I've never, in, in three or four years, I've never had to touch the knobs on that scope. Hmm, wow. That's pretty damn awesome. Yeah. I shoot a lot. I mean, I shoot it a lot. In fact, I got a video with the SPR set up on there. It's my SPR video on my YouTube channel. All right, very cool. Yeah, so definitely you, you get what you you pay for when it comes to optics. I know. And then all I kept thinking is uh, I remember the first time that we talked to Ryan Kluckner, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, whatever your gun is, but your optics should be like two or three times more than that." <laughs> and I'm like, uh, "When?" <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, and it's funny, like when, once you actually really use something that's super high dollar and high quality, like, um, I've got the Vortex Razor Gen 2, uh, LVPO on one of my, on one of my rifles. And I mean, it's like a 18, $1,900 optic and you look through it and it's like beautiful. No matter what you do, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. And it kind of, yeah, it, it ruins you for other stuff once you do use some of the, the more high dollar stuff. Yeah, you give your pay for it, a lot of those. And, but you know, I mean, for what you're using it for, I mean, it, 
if you want to go out and, and be able to shoot that field, definitely be able to get 800 easy, you know, with that 6'5", way beyond that. So, I mean, you, you're going to you'd be well served with any of those choices, but get some good rings, a good mount on there and, uh, and zero it tight. And, and you'll, you won't have any issues with even any of those. All right, cool. Yeah. Cause I just want to do hood rat stuff with my friends. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I actually, so I did like on my Palmetto cause I just want to test that out. This is the first uh, Palmetto gun that I've ever owned. And and you know, I mean, they're definitely less expensive than your typical 308s out there. And people always associate it with like, you know, co- cost and quality. And so I just wanted to check out the quality, but I did tell Sean, I was like, I don't know. You think I should just put like iron sights on there? And he just laughed. I mean, I think people should know how to use iron sights. I, I think iron sights are awesome, but for what you're going to use it for, I think you would be better served by, by an optic. And I have nothing against iron sights. Like I have iron sights on several guns. This is a budget gun though, Sean. I know. Okay. I know. Well, it depends. Like, like I said, when we talked about it, it's like, what are you going to use it for? Yeah. I don't know. I got an email from a guy not too long ago. And he said, I read, what's your advice on a rifle? Uh, I want it to be able to reach out to, you know, six, 700 yards of it, but also do CQB room entries and, you know, I also want it to be under this weight and I want it, you know, to shoot this accurately. And I said, dude, you're describing something that doesn't exist, man. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, I try to have as versatile of a thing as possible. I mean, you know, I just, I mean, set your gun up for what you're going to use it for. And I like one rifle that'll play the entire course, but, you know, if you have a specialized role like that distance stuff, you, you know, set the rifle up for, for distance. Yep. Very, very good advice. All right, I think that that'll do it for that, and then uh, we've just got reviews left. Mm-hmm. All right, so here's the reviews. These these are still from Facebook. I just for a while we were just covering the iTunes reviews, and we really weren't making a dent in the Facebook reviews. So now we're getting caught up on that. But we would appreciate it if you guys left us an iTunes review or a Facebook review. Either way, it definitely helps put our show kind of, you know, on the map. And, uh, yeah, we greatly appreciate it. Definitely do. Uh, first one is up from Corey H. Recommended not only a great podcast to listen to, but it comes with a great community of fellow listeners. Ava's awesome and knowledgeable, and I guess Sean is all right, too, after you get used to him. <laughs> all right. He doesn't win. <laughs> <laughs> Rick D says, recommend a great podcast. Awesome host. Definitely worth listening. Well, we know who Rick is. He's yeah. a patron, and oh. that is probably the less offensive the, the, thing yeah that yeah. he's ever said also loves the d yeah uh kevin c recommended <laughs> gun funny is a hilarious show about a witty jewish woman ava getting revenge on the people that allowed heinous crimes to happen sean lay off the white cake five stars two thumbs up and an entire high point desk pop mag dump that is how good it is <laughs> <laughs> thanks kevin i think actually kevin was in my med class last weekend in georgia nice yeah cody a great show on an awesome network that would be the firearms radio network the dynamic that Sean and Ava have brings so much life to the show. They feed well off of each other and their personalities are infectious. Also our STDs, just for the record, uh, which makes listening to the show a delight. This show is a great blend of humor and knowledge on the firearm industry. Between the shared experience of Ava, Sean, and their guests, you can't help but gain a plethora of firearm knowledge. All right. All right. So, Reed, out of those four, would you do us the honor of picking a winner? Man, they're pretty good across the board. And now you're like, oh, I wasn't even listening. I was, I was trying to figure <laughs> oh, out how I was going to map out my garden. <laughs> no, no, no. I got, I got an attention span. I, I, I just acquired skill. I, I like the third one, honestly. I really do. All right. All right. Where they see. call me a, a witty Jewish woman. Yes. Yeah, I got to take care. I got to take care of my own, you know? <laughs> there you go. I love it. Um, and what, the, what does he win, Ava? They win a Lone Wolf Ultimate Connector Kit with three connectors and a spring. So just contact us on social media and we will get that sent out to you. All right. Awesome. So I guess that brings us to the time where we wrap stuff up. And I just want to tell people, if you want to find everything Gun Funny related, go to gunfunny.com. And there you can find links to everything that we do. Everything. Uh, including our Patreon program. Uh, Reed, you actually mentioned your Patreon earlier and said that it's like pr- been pretty much an awesome platform. I like Patreon. They've been good. And, and, you know, to me, they've, they've allowed people to really, you know, interact. And, uh, yeah, mine's, mine is just Reed Hendricks, you know, Patreon and my name, Reed Hendricks, just like my YouTube channel. 
Nice. I love it. So yeah, with ours, you get a lot of different stuff depending on what level you do. Uh, I think that's the way a lot of people set it up. But with ours, you get access to our Patreon only Facebook group, which, which has is really become awesome. a nice community. Like we're almost kind of family there. Yeah. Um, you get, there's a level where you get t-shirts. There's a level where you get raffles, monthly raffles to win stuff, which we do pretty often. Uh, $25, you get a shout out on the show. But I just want to tell people like, honestly, Patreon dollars help us make the show better. It helps us afford our producer and editor, Kenny Ortega, who does a fantastic job for us every week. And your Patreon pledges specifically, uh, help do things like that. Oh, and if you guys have noticed that the show's been posting much earlier on Mondays, that's because of Kenny. He's on the ball. Totally 100%. So our $25 Patreons are... Cor- Corbin Bonafide. Iraq Veteran 8888. Charger Arms. Ryan Morrison. John Snow. Kevin Riddingham. Nathan Keck. And 2A Jules. And who is our King of the Patreon? King of the Patreons every month is Michael Alexiu. Not every month. Uh, well, right now. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, he is the King of the Patreons, and when asked what he wanted us to say, what message, he just said that, uh, you know, talk about the next he event you're going to. Yeah, so our next event... I'm not sure if this is our next event, but we are planning to go to the NRA annual meeting and we are going to have a listener meetup, uh, somewhere fun, somewhere that involves alcohol. And, uh, guys keep on the lookout for, uh, details for that. If you guys are going to, to Indiana. Yep. And so he also gets King of the Patreon t-shirt. And if you would like to dethrone him, I think $77 is the number. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, one last giveaway, tack pack. Uh, you can go to gunfunny.com slash TP to win a box. Or if you don't want to wait to win, you can just order from TACPAC.com, use coupon code GUNFUNNY, and get a free SOG tool along with your box order. Read again, man. It's been awesome. Uh, they can find you on your YouTube channel, on your Patreon. They can find your book Pistolcraft on Amazon, or they can find everything at ValorRidge.com as well, right? Yes, yes. And once again, uh, I've been a, where's a quick eye came? I believe it's been over an hour already. It went by so fast. You guys are awesome. And I appreciate you having me on the show. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And if you ever, have, you know, need, have need advice questions or anything like that, don't hesitate to, to get a hold of me. Awesome. Yeah. I got your email, your phone number. Uh, this is not going to be the last that you hear from us. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We're going to be I, friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great to be on the show, guys. I really appreciate it, and uh, you know, are very, very gracious. And man, this, this has been a great experience for me. Good. Very cool. Thank you. Go check out reading all the stuff they're getting up to, and uh, everyone else. We will talk to you next week. Want to send feedback? Suggest a place to prank call? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact. <laughs>